thank you for attending this session on digital serenity and why open infrastructure matters. My name is Eduard Idrich. I'm working for the Sylvain CloudSec project as community manager. The SDS project is an open source project hosted by the Open Source Business Alliance. It's a German business association for open source and funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. You may have seen uh, Dr. Brandner this morning at the keynote sessions. Today, I want to talk with you. We need to talk about digital serenity because if you follow recent news and media coverage on cloud technology, you may have seen the term of digital serenity. Digital serenity everywhere. Every cloud claims to be digital sovereign. But let us ask, what does that mean, digital serenity? Let's have a look, let's have a closer look at this term, at this notion, and what needs to be given that a cloud provider, a software stack, an offering really is digital serenity. If we follow recent offerings, in Europe, we have seen local operated spin-offs of proprietary cloud providers. Uh, you name it, uh, GCP with T-Systems, Azure with SAP, Orange with Azure, and so on and so on. They all claim to be sovereign clouds because, and that's the reasoning, because they are hosted and operated in the corresponding jurisdiction. But is this digital serenity because a proprietary cloud stack is provided and operated in the corresponding country? Well, let's have a deeper look. And maybe we should step back and have a look at the term serenity in a general sense. Let's take a huge step backwards to the year 1912, where the lawmaker uh, Lasa Oppenheim stated that there exists perhaps no conception, the meaning of which is more controversial than that of serenity. And it's an indisputable fact that this concep conception from the moment when it was introduced into political science until the present day has never had a meaning which was universally agreed upon. And 110 years later, I think this is still true. But there are some common definitions that we may agree upon in the sense of this talk. Let's define serenity as the supreme authority within a ter territory. And if we think of that as the sovereign, what does that mean in the sense of digital serenity? But the notion of uh, territory does not need to be restricted to pure land mass, but also to the resources lying on the territory of the supreme authority. And in the eye of, recent, uh, of the recent attack of Russia to Ukraine, there have been some examples that you can think of. For example, food sovereignty or energy sovereignty. This means that the supreme authority has the control of the means of production of either food or energy. So, the supreme authority is able to control how food or energy is produced and is able to impact and influence this whole process. But what does that mean in the sense of digital serenity? Does that mean that if my hardware is located in my country, I have full control of the offerings that is run and operated on that hardware? I don't think so. We at the Serene CloudSec project have defined four layers of digital serenity and have claimed them to be like a pile of stack that needs to be claimed. And if we think of these local spin-offs of uh, Azure, GCP, and so on, they may fulfill the legal dimension. This means that the data is processed in the corresponding jurisdiction that the process can be influenced by the countries and by the supreme authority. But there is much more. This will not guarantee that we have a freedom of choice. May I, as supreme authority, can choose between different offerings? Well, 
This is not given with Azure or GCP offerings. Or do we have, in the sense of a technical uh, dimension, the ability to influence this technology, to embrace open technology, to embrace open standards? This is not the case. And last but not least, the whole stack needs to be operated with knowledge and competence. And this means that we need a further dimension of competence. So let's have a look at these stairs. How do we claim the, pill, the uh, hill of digital serenity? Let's ask for, uh, re in regard of the legal dimension. Even if data is processed and stored solely in Europe, isn't there still a strong dependency on one single software provider? So, what will be the solution? Okay, let us add some alternatives. So we can choose between different alternatives. So I can choose between provider A and B, or between solution stack A or B, and able to migrate my data between these offerings. But this needs open standards, this needs migration tools, this needs the transparency of the code so that I am able to migrate my workload from one uh, provider or from one, so from one solution to the another. So if I can choose between different offerings, how can I influence the future evolution of the software? How can I make an impact on how this software will evolve? How can I shape the software and the stack corresponding to my needs as a software or um, in, um, infrastructure provider. So there's another solution. So some people think that just using open source software is this digital serenity. Well, let's have a look. Even if we have the possibility to inspect, use, modify, and share the software, how can I contribute to design decisions or upstream code? So, am I digital sovereign because of using open source software, or does it need more? And I think you're pretty aware of what this more means, because you're here at the Open Infra Summit, and you all heard of the open, four opens. So let's call them the Fantastic Four. What we need is open source, open design, open development, and open community. So that we have the ability in an open process, in an open community, to influence this software, to have an impact, and to contribute to upstream so, uh, projects. I think in the keynote, there was a short remark on single uh, vendor uh, open source software. And this is not the case in regard of digital sovereignty. Even if I am able to inspect the code, even if I am able to share, redistribute the code, I will not be able to contribute if the single source provider is not able to migrate that or is not willing to um, um, have my contributions uh, migrated into the upstream code. So, are we done yet? Is this all we need? Do we need the legal dimension? Do we need the freedom of choice and the four opens to embrace open standards and open communities? Well, Mr. Y is yet uh, again here and is asking himself, even if I can participate in the community developing the software, how the heck am I supposed to operate this stack? And I already showed you the stairs. There needs to be more than just four opens. There needs to be a transparent process of sharing operational knowledge between providers, between stack providers, between infrastructure providers. And this, if you're curious, is something that we will promote tomorrow in the session by Kurt and Felix. So if you're interested, feel free to onboard into the session tomorrow on the open operations concept. For true self-determination in the ever-growing digital realm, we urgently need to build skills and share knowledge freely and in unlimited ways, also in the realm of operational knowledge, exactly the way we started with software code almost 40 years ago. And this shift in the paradigm of the four opens will embrace real digital sovereignty, because I, as supreme authority, I, as an infrastructure provider, am able 
to choose between alternatives to have an impact on the upstream project and to operate this whole stack. If you're curious, I already invited you to the session tomorrow at the same time um, in the room um, beside us, an open operations concept by Kurt and Felix. Feel free to join it and to discuss further implications of that open operations concept that we urgently need to embrace real digital serenity and to have a real impact on what is to be claimed digital serenity. So, to sum it up, what we need is a legal dimension, the freedom of choice, technological dimension, and an open operations concept to embrace the dimension of sharing and um, contributing to open operational knowledge. If you're interested in the whole white paper we have written for the cloud report, feel free to grab one copy at uh, booth A3 of B1 Systems. Um, we have condensed it in a German and in an English version, so you can read on what our thoughts are on digital serenity and that it needs just more than and jurisdiction and local spin-offs of proprietary cloud providers. And you can also check our website where, have, where we have condensed the whole white paper in the blog post and to dig further into our perception of open operations and real digital serenity besides and aside of the claims of the hyperscalers. So let's step back. Locally operated GCP, Azure spin-offs are not serene at all. What we need are the four layers I mentioned, and my last call to action is, let's demystify digital serenity and embrace open technology hosted by an open committee with open operational knowledge and not bullshitting around with terms that are not paying into anything else than marketing and the misuse of the word digital society, as we have seen in the previous slides, that this does not embrace the supreme authority of a software stack of hardware in the digital realm at all. So I'm happy to discuss the implications of this, these four layers, these four layers with you, and feel free to contribute to our perception of digital society. Feel free to ask, feel free to contribute, happy to discuss with you. Thank you. Any remarks, questions so far? What is your notion of digital sovereignty in your company, in your offerings? How do you use this term? I'm just interested in embracing and um, evolving this discussion around digital serenity and how we can s make an impact on the current discussions around uh, cloud technology and sovereign offerings. Yeah? There's a microphone. Um, I can pass it on to you. Uh, thank you. Um, great presentation. I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned you know, things like on-prem, uh, GCP, and Azure. Um, I'm just wondering what you make of the uh, sovereign controls that Google are introducing next year. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Um, um, uh, just, um, uh, just asking what you make of the, uh, the sovereign controls that Google are introducing next year. <laughs> Google sovereign controls, yes. Is anyone? Uh, yes, well, they're basically to control uh, where data is being stored, where it's where it's flowing. But of course, it is, as the presenter said, it's it's a single vendor thing. So, uh, I'm just really interested in the opinion of of, of what that means, you know, what Google's trying to attempt with sovereign controls versus what you've um, mentioned here. Well, we need to get in touch with the discussions. We need to make an impact on the current discussions around sovereignty. And we need to 
demystify this whole term, because I think there is, as Lasse Oppenheim stated 120 years before, that there is no common sense of this notion of sovereignty, and every company uh, nowadays claims to be sovereign. But what we need to embrace is this concept of four layers, that it needs much more than just local control of the data where the, the stack is processed and operated, but it needs more like um, control of the community, like um, being able to contribute and being part of community that embraces this open technology, building on open standards. And we need to always remember the, the whole um, four layers of sovereignty and not just uh, the bottom layer that um, some providers claim. We need to make it clear that this, this does not guarantee serenity, and there are many, many pitfalls if you just claim that this um, offering uh, is sovereign in the sense of digital serenity. Like, for example, what happens if the software vendor does not um, contribute any upstream patches? What happens if um, security vulnerabilities are not openly um, given back to the uh, local operators? There are many, many pitfalls, and we need to remember the people trying to sell these offerings, that um, it needs more, and that it's dangerous to um, believe that this will grant digital serenity. I, I like your, your, your point here, uh, but, but you, you're touching upon some big problem. And uh, I, I'm just curious that uh, uh, digital sovereignty is a lot bigger than what we all you know, thought about it. How, how are we gonna educate even, let's say in, his, in this region, I know it, European region is easier to educate more than, let's say, I'm from Asia. And in those, in those regions, I think it's really more critical in terms of trying to, to do what you said here. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what, what should be the best way to educate people to understand uh, all these things. It, it's not that easy to understand, and I'm just... Well, just make them aware of these four layers and try to hold up the discussions around digital serenity and not just give up on the marketing buzzwords and hypes around digital serenity. Embrace these four layers and try to contact the politicians, try to contact the industry, and try to make them aware that they won't have the full control of a stack if they just operate or sell in in a in, in local spin-off of a proprietary cloud provider. And make them aware of the pitfalls that will be um, delivered with these offerings and that we won't be able to have full control of the stack. And I think these four layers can be shown very good with, with the, the image of the stairs, and that this is just the beginning of a journey and not the end of a journey to have full control over infrastructure and to have influence on the stack and, and the operating systems. Well, um, for example, the Sovereign Cloud Stack project is hosted by the Open Source Business Alliance. It's an association of companies embracing open source technologies, and we are trying to make um, the public administrations, the politics aware of um, digital serenity, and that it needs much more than just local spin-offs, and um, we try to um, embrace the four opens, the open source um, technology, 
and to make them aware of these concepts. And um, I think this is the state of art, how to embrace um, serenity in the public. So, yeah? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Uh, indeed, I, I agree with you. It's a very hot topic. Uh, a lot of words about uh, digital sovereignty and so on. But don't you think that digital sovereignty, the, the term is a bit too packed with too much? Because if you think about it, if you think about the entire stack, not just a cloud vendor, it includes software, it, it includes also firmware, hardware, wouldn't it be easier to um, decompose it and, and address piece by piece? Because as far as I know, there are no major European uh, hardware platform vendors. And, and without, uh, without a very close collaboration with a hardware platform vendor, you're not likely to get software that is very, very competitive because you're always going to be the second or third one to get access to the newest features. So wouldn't it be a better strategy to decompose it and start from, let's say, software sovereignty and then build up from that because my my concern is that so far I've noticed that this digital sovereignty becomes like a swamp it's like everything in the kitchen sink and and then the debate is lost yeah some people are trying to um to define this digital sovereignty as data sovereignty and um, yes, maybe this is the bottom layer, uh, as we call it, that data sovereignty, that I'm able to be in control of where the data is processed. And yes, I agree that we should decompose this whole term in the sense of these four layers. And the mission is just to make the people aware that this whole term, digital sovereignty, does not necessarily be limited to the whole um, legal aspect, but that there, there is much more. And I agree that um, in regards of hardware and um, the, the bottom layer of the whole, um, there is much more needs to be done. And um, this is just the beginning of a journey. And um, we need to embrace um, the four opens and that we need um, to build uh, open technology uh, together. And um, this is the whole what we need uh, to do. And, and that, that's the problem that I have in terms of trying to say, okay, hey, uh, I'm, provide, I'm, I'm a cloud provider, and if you're going to use GCP and Azure, uh, your sovereignty is gone. And then they look at me like, well, you know, where, where, I, I mean, it look like you're going back, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody going forward. And, and this is what I, I uh, encounter and, and the experience that I try to tell them, okay, hey, if you use a local cloud, it's, it's better because you you get the uh, the sovereignty, but if you use you know uh, hyperscaler or two of them, you you're gonna involve with this. So uh, I get both negative and and uh, positive things. So it, it's good to really uh, narrow down a little bit, or you can use the word decompose it to to make it uh, a little bit narrow. That that's my point of view. That's all. Yeah, I totally agree, and we have the same discussions um, in Germany that um, this term is to be um, dangerous. And I think we have to be very clear about what we claim to be digital sovereignty and what freedoms we guarantee with this sovereignty. But I think it is very necessary to have a common term we can re rely on to embrace the culture of open technology and open communities to embrace um, operational knowledge and to embrace open uh, technology and thus um, this digital serenity. But um, what we need to do is to spin around the whole discussion um, upwards from the only legal aspects up to all what is needed to be sovereign in the sense of self-determination in the digital realm.
Okay, so, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, well, I have seen some discussion in the Asian um, Pacific room, and um, I have, was not aware until now of discussions um, likely to be compared in the United States. So um, if anybody can contribute to these um, questions, feel free um, to raise your hand. But um, I think and it was stated um, earlier today in the keynotes that this is primarily a European discussions, but to, if we break it down, it's uh, a fight for open technology and how we can influence technology. And from my point of view, this is not only a European um, debate, but also a worldwide debate on how we want as a society, as mankind, to have influence on technology and um, how we embrace open technology. So, thank you for discussing. I will be repeating this session tomorrow at 11. And um, if you have any other remarks, feel free to either follow us on the usual, usual social platforms or to follow our blog post on scs.community and to continue this discussion and fighting for open technology and embracing open communities and sharing operational knowledge. Thank you. And visit the session on open operations tomorrow by Kurt and Felix. Have a nice summit. Thank you. Thank you.